that's another typical mistake people do. And like, they don't, they, they're not going to uh, utilize so much energy, you know, mm-hmm. calories, you know, um, but it's an education that you know, it's a lot of education piece and, uh, and going back to everything related to carbohydrates. So there's, there, there's not one research yet showing that carbohydrates are bad for performance. Wow. Welcome to the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast, where it's all about learning from the best and most inspiring minds in the sport. So together, we can train a smarter, healthier, and faster running community. Now, here's your host, Tina Muir. Hello, this is Tina Muir. Thank you so much for joining me for the latest episode of the Runners Connect Run to the Top podcast. I know there's so many different ways you could be spending your time, so I really appreciate you being here with me today, and I am sure you're not going to regret listening to this one. So before I get on to that, last week we talked to David Alley, who talked about his two races all the way around the edge of Australia after never even doing a marathon. It's absolutely incredible story, and if you needed some motivation, make sure you go back and check that out. Now today, we're kind of going more into the science. Um, we're talking to Dr. Inigo San Milan, who is the Director of Exercise Physiology at the University of Colorado. And he's worked with all kinds of different uh, world-class athletes, including one Tour de France winner, numerous cyclists, uh, runners, rowers, triathletes, many different sports, basketball, all kinds of different things. Uh, He's done a TED Talk on metabolic diseases, and he's going to talk to us today about carbs and how they might actually not be to blame. You know, recently there's been a lot of publicity about how bad they are for you, and actually you'll find out in this interview that I actually kind of challenged him a little bit on this, as I have been kind of lowering my carb intake, and I found that I actually felt better. So um, it really is an interesting uh, talk, and I think you're really going to enjoy what he has to say. So after a quick word from our sponsor, we will get right to it. Running with music or podcasts distract us when there's mental demons allowed, but not when you're tangled in cords. Jabra Pulse is a wireless sports earbud that is perfect for runners of all levels and speed. Visit jabra.com forward slash runners connect to enter to win a free Jabra Pulse every month. Welcome to the Run to the Top podcast, Inigo. Hello. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me here. I am so excited to have you here. And uh, I just mentioned to you in the pre-intro that we were just talking a second ago. And, uh, you know, I've really been looking forward to this one. So let's kind of start with you. Um, So I want to start with your background. So you're working as the Director of Exercise Physiology at the University of uh, Colorado. But I'm sure already people have guessed, or maybe if not, they'll know in a second, but you are not actually from Colorado or maybe you are, but uh, the accent kind of says differently. So will you share your story and kind of how you ended up here? Yeah, well, um, I'm uh, originally from Spain, and uh, I've been here in the United States living now for eight years. And um, yeah, and I've been working all my life uh, with athletes, professionally speaking, uh, for 20 years. And before that, I was an athlete myself. Um, I, I, I played six years in Real Madrid in the, uh, in the academy level at soccer. And then I turned into cycling, and then I, I was for two years a professional cyclist. But I, as I always say, I, I never got to be at the top, top level of any of the sports. So I'm, I, I, I define myself as a frustrated and truncated professional <laughs> and elite athlete, right? But I, I learned a lot, um, and always I've been very curious about how the body works, how to improve performance, and that's where like, I started to study in this field. And, um, yeah, and I started working, I've been working for 20 years with all kinds of athletes, uh, you know, internationally. And, uh, now I'm happy to be at the university, uh, the school of medicine and directing the sports performance program at uh, the university of Colorado. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to go into that a lot deeper, but one thing that came up when you were just saying that right there, you said you, you never quite got to the top level, but if you could go back, do you think if you had the knowledge you have now, do you think you could have reached it with kind of the extra things you've learned or was that uh, kind of your ceiling anyway? Yeah, I always say that I, you know, if I had known what I know now, I would have been either Ronaldo or I have one through the France multiple occasions. Ah, no, it's just kidding. No. <laughs> I, I definitely, you know, like uh, I, I would have gotten farther, you know, because one of the problems that I had, uh, especially when I was a cyclist, when I was more mature already um, within my younger years, obviously, but uh it was that, yeah, it's just I made a lot of mistakes of overtraining. 
uh, nutrition, uh, you know, lots of mistakes that I see now in tons and tons of athletes, both at the elite level and at the recreational level. And that's where I now, I, I identify myself with many of these people, right, coming to us, to the clinic, you know, or to the laboratory, you know, tired, fatigued, overtrained, you know, they can't get to their top level. And as I have been done that road before, you know, had I known what I know now, mm-hmm. I, I would have gotten in my, in my sport uh, much farther. Yeah, I'm sure that helps a lot. And uh, so did you find that maybe the things you went through where you were, you know, maybe overtraining or you had some trouble yourself, did that kind of start your interest in it or were you interested even before you were kind of trying to compete? Yeah, at level? I was I was actually interested before, I would say. I Yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, when I was 14 years old, I, 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 you know, a friend of mine gave me a book that uh, someone had given to his dad. You know, it was like a weird book, thick book. Uh, it was an exercise physiology book and I started to read it and read it. And, uh, I started doing my, you know, some tests to myself. So I've been, I've been very, uh, interested, you know, since an earlier age. Wow. That, 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 you sound like you remind me of, uh, in movies every now and again, you see someone who, you know, reads a dictionary or, you know, just wants to learn and take in every little piece of information they can. So that's cool to actually talk to someone who, who in a way is kind of like that. So then. Oh, thank you. <laughs> in you a way sh- only, I mean, uh, I, I just, I just got that book and I was very fascinated yeah. about how the body works. And, uh, so I read it for one year. And at the end, and, and I, I was struggling because it was a difficult book. And at oh, the end yeah. of the year, I started over again. And when I uh, remember my third or fourth year of college, we had a, uh, a course called Advanced Exercise Physiology. And so they, were, they recommended as a book that it has, it was a course book. And I went to buy it like, whoa, <laughs> that's the book that I read when I was 14. You know, so that's what I realized, man, you know, I, I, I like this, you know, so... Yeah. Very exciting. And, and so, you know, um, you, you went on to kind of take it up as a career, which is kind of impressive, actually, that you were able to figure out the direction you wanted to go so early. And I, I'm sure a lot of people, myself included, are kind of jealous uh, with that. But um, will you share some of the findings? Maybe you've kind of come across some of the big ones that you um, have found in your, from your work in the Human Performance Lab, maybe about overtraining or one of those aspects yeah. that you mentioned? Yeah. So yeah, that's oof, that. There are a lot of things over the mm-hmm. years, but uh, I mean, one thing that um, um, the first thing that stands out right away um, is the whole overtraining, you know, and the wrong training that people are doing at the recreational level, mm-hmm. right? So um, you know, and everything more started when I came here to the U.S. eight years ago, uh, before I was pretty much working with elite and professional athletes, uh, and that's what I that was my own world, right? But when when I came here, I had to start up a program from zero and obviously we had to open the doors to the community and that's what I started to work with a lot of recreational athletes. Now it was a big learning curve to be honest because when I first started working with athletes I never had the with recreational athletes I never thought that they could get overtrained or they would be training so wrongly, right? Uh, I said to myself, hey come on, these people are training six hours a week, 10 hours a week, there's no way they can get overtrained, right? Uh, as opposed to what I see with the professional athletes, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, but I was way wrong, you know, because I started to, to see a lot of suspicious things going on with their performance, their, their physiological parameters, blood analysis. I do a lot of blood analysis to look at biomarkers from, for training. What is that? The- uh, blood analysis. To oh, look blood at bio- analysis. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. biomarkers. And that's what I started to say, holy cow, these people are like, they have the same issues as professional athletes or even worse. And that's what I started to, you know, connect more dots. And, you know, professional athletes, they definitely get overtrained. And, uh, but they have an entourage of people around them all mm-hmm. the time, experts, mm-hmm. right? They control them, they monitor them. Recreational athletes are, for the most part, on their own. And that's where I, I start to see that, yeah, on top of this, these people that might only train seven hours a week or eight hours a week, they were, they're type, type A individuals, right? Most of them. And uh, they, um, yeah, they, 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 they work 50 hours a week. They have families, they travel, you know, and uh, so, yeah, they really get over, over trained. And, and that's something that it worries me because it's a growing, growing population. Uh, as you know very well, runners, for example, before they would, at the recreational level, they would just run around the block, right? 
And now they're entering, um, you know, trying to qualify for Boston, right, in their age group or trying to improve their PR in their local marathon, right? So that means that they train with a purpose, right? Uh, and, and, and that's where, like, um, you know, they're, they're not training the right way and they're not eating the right way. They're not recovering the right way. And there are a lot of issues over training fatigue, injuries. So that's another thing that kind of, like, uh, you know, uh, it really stands out. Yeah, and then so there's there's so many things I want to kind of ask you more about. But um, what would you like to say, or what have you discovered uh, as to why that could be? You know, people listening thinking, well, like you said, I only run seven hours a week, and these elite runners are running, you know, twenty. How yeah. how can I, how can I possibly be overtrained? Have you kind of found how that couldn't be all the time? Oh uh, well, yeah. So I mean, the main thing and this is like a uh, uh, first. The, um, uh, the workload that many of these people have, right? They work 50 hours a week. They might sleep five hours a night. Uh, they eat on the run. They even, even try to restrict carbohydrates and calories, you know. And on top of that, they, they train at different intensities, you know. There's another thing that kind of like, a, it is like caught me a little bit by a surprise that um, the way we work with elite athletes and the way elite athletes and world-class runners work and train is a completely different uh, uh, extreme as what recreational athletes uh, train, you know. So uh, at, the, at the endurance level uh, and even at high intensity levels, at the, at the world-class professional level, about 70 to 80 percent of all the workload is in the endurance, lower intensity mode. Mm-hmm. Whereas when we see it at the recreational level, it's the opposite. You know, everything is like, oh, it has to it has to hurt, you know, yeah. it has to be always high intensity. So that, that alone, that they're not prepared, they don't know how to eat, how to recover, uh, that definitely pushes them uh, over the limit. Yeah, and, and like you mentioned, a lot of it comes down to lifestyle. So almost kind of overtrained from life, in essence. I know, I know I've, I've been there even as a professional runner. I've kind of got to the point where I've stretched myself too thin, not so much in the running, but in the other areas. Yeah, so it's exactly. good to hear you say that and so someone listening right now um if they are thinking oh you know that doesn't sound good what kind of symptoms would someone did you find people would have if they were kind of getting into that um overtraining state yeah well so one thing also that you know surprises me is like you know the the, the, the feeling of waking up tired right this is like a you know a professional athlete wakes up tired, mm, so goes out there running, you know, with the Raiders on, right? And they know their bodies very well, right? And they are in tune with the body. And if they feel that, man, I have to push it extra hard today just to go at the same pace, it doesn't make much sense. They know that, uh, they turn around and they call the day, right? And the next day, if they wake up tired, you know, they, 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 they take it easy. They do maybe some core training or, or, or stretching, you know? Whereas the recreational athlete, you know, wakes up tired and they say, hey, I'm an athlete, I'm a runner, I'm supposed to be tired, right? And they keep pushing it, they push it through the day, right? So this is one of the first thing that when I explain this to recreational athletes, that the professional athletes, they, they're never tired, right? It's just like, they say, really? Are you serious? Mm-hmm. You know, so why in the world I'm tired? Well, you're tired because you're not doing things right. And that's the fir- very first thing to keep in mind when you wake up tired and you, you feel that you need to push it and push it, right? Another thing, obviously, that like, uh, yeah, it's very typical to see that the rest of your activities throughout the day, whether it's work, time with family, et cetera, right? They start suffering, you know, because you're struggling, you're, you're sluggish, you know, at work. You're just like, oh man, I can't wait to go home and, and go to bed, right? That's another sign that, man, it's just something is not clicking right, you know? And um, so, yeah, those are very easy things, you know, um, for people, we can more get into more details if you want to. But for example, people using a heart rate, right, monitor. Mm-hmm. Uh, typical thing is like uh, if they know how their heart rate is at their given pace, if their heart rate doesn't get up, doesn't go up, and they have to push it as another sign of overtraining fatigue. Uh, there are different biomarkers that we use uh, to tell and teach professional athletes, right, how to learn, you know, how to, the body works and responds and uh but yeah that's a, a teaching process right that that um um you know, most recreational athletes they, they they have never been exposed to yeah yeah and i'm glad you mentioned about the blood markers as well i actually uh, one of my sponsors is um inside tracker i'm not sure if you've heard of them but yeah, they do. yeah 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 they do analysis like that and have the markers and um you know i've 
I have regularly get um, checked with that and I've been tested and I'm going to get tested again next week. I'm giving my marathon a bit of time to go through my legs and then I'm going to get redone and check the levels. And, um, you know, I definitely would recommend people check out Inside Tracker and I will put a link to them in the show notes with a bit of a discount. But um, what biomarkers should people be looking for when they are kind of uh, thinking that they might be overtrained? Well, the different biomarkers, uh, you know, both at the uh, red blood cell production, right, level, which is like red blood cell itself, mm-hmm. or you have also hemoglobin, right, which directly transfers oxygen. Uh, you know, if, if you decrease one point, your hemoglobin as a result of overtraining. So every day, every day, for example, we destroy 200 billion with B red blood cells, right? So we need to replace them, right? Mm-hmm. So it's, 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 it's a huge amount of red blood cells, right? So if, if someone is overtrained or fatigued, they're still losing the ability to, to replenish, you know, to replace what they have lost. So, so that's why we st- you start seeing a decrease in red blood cell value. So values. the number is low for the red blood cell. Exactly. Okay. And uh, so the, the red blood cell carries the oxygen, right? And, uh, and the hemoglobin, is, I, the red blood cell is like the taxi of the oxygen. Mm-hmm. And the hemoglobin that is encapsulated within the red blood cell is the seat where the oxygen sits on, right? And uh, so we can m- track both, you know, I, I, I track that with elite athletes on a monthly basis even to, to checkpoint, checkpoint, everything is going well. So if someone, if someone decreases the hemoglobin by one point, which happens all the time, their oxygen carrying capacity right there is going to decrease five to 7%, right? Oh, okay. So uh, many times, for example, is a whole marginal gains too. Uh, we're looking at their, um, 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 the, the, you know, the lightest running shoes or, or the best gear or, you know, uh, that's the 1%, right? Because you can buy, it's tangible, you could take it home. Mm-hmm. Uh, but many times, you know, we have a decrease in 5 7% right there in oxygen carrying capacity, which is going to definitely have an impact on performance. Uh, what we see is like people, if this is a typical thing, people decrease their hemoglobin and mm, they start losing their snap right? And they're not feeling so sharp as they were, right? So intuitively, uh, what they think, or they talk to their coaches and intuitively like, yeah, it's just, you're getting closer to your goal, right? To your marathon or your half marathon or whatever. And yeah, you need to do more anaerobic intensity, right? Uh, and, and that, that puts people more uh, deeper into a hole, mm. right? And that's where like a lot of people just, they, they, they fail many times in, in getting their, their goals. Uh, another thing that we see is, uh, uh, muscle damage biomarkers, there are different muscle enzymes, you know, that uh, denoting they're denoting fatigue and muscle damage. They're uh, they're very normal in, in athletes as well, and that's another thing we can look at these markers, and by that just get to know the uh, degree of muscle damage that they have, and uh, and it's just a big deal. I see a lot of runners, you know, with extensive muscle damage all the time. And what markers are those like on the test? What would they come up? So with? there there are different enzymes that I use. I use like score. I, I look at. Uh, from uh, LDA, CK, EST, ALT, even uh, um, 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 what's it, uh, uh, troponin as well we can use, okay. you know. So different biomarkers that we do, and uh, it just gives us a lot of information. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's one of the things that we do to monitor. Um, but another thing that I see is that uh, the people don't know how to train either, you know, which is what it precipitates, you know, people getting into overtraining state. You know, the whole thing of like, you have to train high intensity, high intensity. That all of a sudden is the trend, and uh, you know, it's just like no, you know, at the highest level, you know, a professional level, very few people do that, yeah. right? And uh, and that's something that, uh, but you know, like uh, yeah, we go a lot by what you know tendencies and trends. You know, the whole thing also restricting carbohydrates, right? Because all of a sudden, I always say, you know, carbohydrates have just been sent ten years ago only by aliens from outer space to exterminate humankind because they have never been around that. <laughs> you know? and anyways, but it's a tendency that people, so, and, and this is a concerning thing when you, when you add people uh, overdoing it because they don't train in the right zones, high intensity, uh, they work 50 hours a week, they don't know how to recover, how to sleep well, how to eat, and then obviously they restrict uh, nutrition, especially carbohydrates. It's a perfect storm. And yeah. that's another thing that we keep fixing every week, people like that. And to be honest, we work more into the fixing than into the preparing for Mm -hmm. a goal. No, that makes total sense. And actually that that works well to kind of transition into the next thing I want to talk about, um, which is like uh, metabolic disorders. And um, you did do a TED talk 
um, a few years ago, I think, about yeah. um, about the diet weight loss industry and, you know, how we just keep getting worse. You kind of started talking about it a little bit there. So maybe you could share with us, you know, some of your thoughts on this. And, uh, you know, I really think this is going to be interesting for our listeners. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we could be talking about this a long time, right? But, uh, yeah, so w- when it comes to the whole uh, nutrition deal, you know, and uh, and, and the, you know, the weight loss industry is a multi-billion dollar industry per year, right? And everybody's trying to sell a book, right? Or a supplement or a diet or a program. And uh, the immense majority of times are not based on science. And that's where like a lot of people get caught up into this, right? And, uh, and more and more, especially now because of the internet, right? Uh, it's much easier to spread the word, you know? And, um, and yeah, nowadays you can, you can put anything on the internet and you don't have to prove it. And that's one of the things that, uh, you know, a lot of people are getting caught into this, right? Um, uh, you know, like, do you want me to focus more on the nutrition or the my- metabolic diseases? Or, um, whatever you, or, whatever you like. Um, yeah. I'm sure so, it's interesting. <laughs> I mean, it's just one of the things that, for example, that, um, um, we see at, at the, at the whole, uh, the metabolic disease or cardiometabolic disease is like the mitochondrial dysfunction is behind the pathogenesis of many of these diseases, right? So, uh, the mitochondria are present in trillions of cells, right? It's, it's literally the powerhouse of the cell. This is where we burn fuel. That's where we burn fats, carbohydrates, or sugars, and we'll burn so, so proteins, right? So um, uh, one of the things that's behind uh, this is like type 2 diabetes, for example, or metabolic syndrome, right? It's like there's insulin resistance, and there's a difficulty to burn or oxidize uh, glucose and fatty acids as well, right? And now that the only place where you can burn it is in the mitochondria. Right, so physical inactivity, uh, it just uh, causes a mitochondrial dysfunction because you lose the property. Therefore, the mitochondria cannot burn properly mm-hmm. the carbohydrates or the glucose. Right, therefore they build up in the bloodstream, and therefore the pancreas senses that and starts releasing more insulin. Right, because insulin is what kind of facilitates the transport of glucose into the the cells. Yeah. However, insulin doesn't facilitate the burning of glucose in the mitochondria right, which is inside the cell, right? So that's where like the body keeps releasing more and more insulin and eventually people become insulin resistant and, uh, and type 2 diabetic, right? Uh, there's a connection between type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, you know, because about 80% of people with type 2 diabetes have cardiovascular disease and vice versa. And that's why more and more people are talking now about the whole cardiometabolic disease, right? Combining both, right? And that's another thing that happens, you know, when you cannot oxidize fats very well in the mitochondria, right? Because that's the only place where you can burn it. Mm-hmm. That's where the stars are building up. They build up around the mitochondria and that's what's called the fat droplet. They also build around the tissues and around the bloodstream, obviously, and that's directly correlated with uh, with uh, cardiovascular disease, you know. So that could be one of the connections to at the mitochondrial level. But definitely for the more metabolic disease like type 2 diabetes, it's, it's clear and clear that there's a mitochondrial dysfunction as the epicenter of, of the diseases. Um, and that's why, like, the whole movement of exercise is medicine because the only thing that we know that can uh, maintain or improve mitochondrial function is exercise, Right, and that's where like uh, exercise is is so good for you, and that's where like on the opposite metabolic pole, we see um, uh, the elite endurance athletes, right, mm-hmm. runners, cyclists, triathletes, you know, who they uh, they never develop uh, the acquired forms, right, not the genetic, which is a small percentage, but the acquired forms are the majority. You know, you will not see like a a, a runner, you know, an active runner or endurance elite athlete with type two diabetes or obesity or you know, or insulin resistance, you know, it, it doesn't exist, right? So that's where, like, they have the best mitochondria. So therefore, it's a whole new term. It's called metabolic flexibility. They're flexible to switch back and forth fuels, right? And in fact, you know, elite endurance athletes are the population in the world with, by a landslide, has the, uh, uh, the highest uh, simple sugars and carbohydrates intake of any humans, mm-hmm. you know? And uh, so therefore, you know, like, definitely if sugar was what's killing us, right? These people who have this diet for decades and decades, you know, they should have the worst health of any humans. And in fact, they have, by a landslide, the best health of any humans, right? So I'm not saying that you, that, that the sugar is great for you, but uh, the problem is not in the sugar itself. It's like where you metabolize the sugar. If you have a mitochondrial dysfunction, as two-thirds of Americans are going to be having, right? Therefore, you cannot burn glucose. Therefore, 
glucose, you know, like simple sugars diet that, that they're making things worse, right? But the, the, the primary element, you know, is like that mitochondrial dysfunction as a result of physical inactivity. Okay, so then what about uh, one thing that comes to my mind, which I, you know, I did think about before, um, what about, you know, people listening or, you know, especially myself as an elite athlete, what if you're guilty of thinking, okay, well, I run, I do the physical activity, so I can eat whatever I want. Is that, does that kind of fall through, fall through, or is that true? Like we've, um, we've kind of, uh, been pushed away from that idea, but that's what my immediate thought was when you just said that right there. Uh, absolutely, you know, and we know we know very well, you know, and for that to be honest, we don't need science for that, you know, mm -hmm. we just have to be observational. Anybody who has been working for a long time with elite endurance athletes, they say the same thing, man, they, these people eat everything they want to, tremendous amount of foods, tremendous amount of sugars, right? They love McDonald's, <laughs> they love all this junk food here and there, you know, and they're so lucky because they never gain weight, right? And that's because they're flexible metabolically speaking, you know? Uh, but yeah, now we're taking, no, this is bad for you, bad for you. And that uh, people are starting to restrict diets a lot, mm -hmm. you know, when they should not restrict it because they have a much higher caloric expenditure as regular individuals. They're starting to restrict carbohydrates when they should not because the research out there shows that carbohydrates and glycogen are crucial for performance, right? And that's where like all of a sudden we have a whole different problem, you know, that is happening with a lot of endurance athletes. And, and that's what I was saying. It's a, it's a constant fight. Uh, we have every day and we keep fixing people more than helping them, you know, uh, improve the record. So uh, as opposed to be from the baseline when they come to us and increase the bar, right? They come in, they're in a hole, right? And we have to fix them, bring them back to a baseline. You know, we do this all the time. And, and, and you know, and, and the whole thing is that there's, there's no scientific evidence at all about uh, all these crazy extreme diets, you know, that people are doing, you know. Um, it's funny, you know, going, for example, with the paleo, which I think it's a great diet with people with that type two diabetes, for example, because it restricts carbohydrates, mm -hmm. right? And uh, which is a, a big challenge metabolically speaking if you don't have good mitochondrial uh, function or, or metabolic flexibility. But for athletes, you know, it's another, it's it's a whole different area, you know. Um, that's the whole thing, you know. We 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 know very well, you know, that glycogen is very very important. You know, one thing is that I developed a methodology with uh, my, my colleague, uh, Dr. John Hill from the University of Colorado, where we look at glycogen content. So we developed a methodology where we can uh, measure glycogen uh, with high-frequency ultrasound in a non-invasive way. So pretty much we scan the muscles, and in about less than a minute, we can give you uh, the amount of glycogen that you have in your muscles, right? So that's what we know a lot about this, because we see people all the time that their gasoline tank, it's, 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 it's empty or halfway full, right? And that's where like, uh, hey, you know, you, you need to eat more carbohydrates, you know? We use this for the opposite. Sometimes people, they, they have a very good diet and they're, you know, tapering maybe a week or so before their event and they start piling up on carbohydrates and we tell them, no, just keep, keep eating the same thing, you know? You're tapering, you're not going to utilize a lot of glycogen because you're not going to be exercising much and therefore it's just with the regular diet you have, it's plenty because when you... When your glycogen storages are full, that's when you turn more into fat, right? But when the glycogen storages are, half, half, are halfway full, you need to put gasoline in the tank. Okay, so even though, you know, you've kind of uh, been like dispelling the myth that, you know, carbs are to blame for all of our issue, issues and, you know, been kind of saying that maybe that isn't so much the case, you... Let me just clarify, you did just say that when it comes to like, you know, you have a marathon on the Sunday, you don't really need to you know, overdo it on the carbs, just kind of eat as you usually would? For the most part, yes. Uh, but, uh, but so, and this is what we see people who maybe uh, they're not aware, they're not eating enough, right? And that's where like uh, we can see very well, you know, like, hey, you need to crank it up a little bit more. Sometimes people that, oh man, I'm carb, I have to carb a lot because that's what they tell me, you know, like, no, you don't, you know, you have plenty of fuel, you know, you're going to be fine, you know. Mm -hmm. Another mistake that people do also is like they run for, they go for 45 minutes, right? A run, and they start like drinking yeah. and you know, <laughs> sports drinks and come back and have shakes, you know, with all kinds of stuff. And like, whoa, you know, you have only burnt 400 calories, mm -hmm. you know, put back a thousand, right? That's another typical mistake people do. And like, they don't, they, they're not gonna uh, utilize so much energy, you know, mm -hmm. calories, you know. Um, but it's an education, that, you know, it's a lot of education piece. And, uh, and going back to everything related to carbohydrates, so, 
there's there, there's not one research yet showing that carbohydrates are bad for performance. Oh. Uh, all the research, uh, about 85% of all the research done in the last 50 years or so show that glycogen and carbohydrates, they improve performance. Mm-hmm. About 12, 15% of the research shows that there's no difference. Uh, but the immense majority, they say that, uh, that they're absolutely improved performance, but there's zero research showing they're bad for performance. In fact, all these people not claiming that you have to, you know, restrict carbohydrates and increase fat, you know, uh, there's absolutely no research showing that that improves performance. It improves fat oxidation. As we see in the laboratory all the time, if you have low glycogen content and higher fat um, uh, diet, yeah, you burn more, 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 more fat. We see this in the laboratory every day because one of the things that I measure in the laboratory is fat and carbohydrate utilization in grams mm-hmm. per minute. So we can see it through a different exercise intensity, how much fat and how much glucose or carbohydrates you're oxidizing, you're burning, right? So we see this all the time. Someone who comes restricting carbohydrates severely, absolutely, they burn more fat. However, that their, their performance is poor. When we revert that situation and we convince that people to go back to a normal, not necessarily a high carbohydrate diet, but a normal carbohydrate diet, fat oxidation decreases slightly, but performance goes sky high. Interesting. You know, and that's where, like, uh, that's where, like, people claiming that fat, fat is good. Like, well, there's absolutely no data on improvements in performance out there. This is absolutely fascinating and kind of interesting that you've come at this point because I actually um, recently I just did the London Marathon, as I as I mentioned to you, and um, for those listeners who. Um, who don't know, I did actually, yeah, I ran the London Marathon um, and I ran a four minute PR. But interestingly, cool. I have, um, yep, I was really proud of it. <laughs> My 2.37. Um, I, um, at the last few months, I have been doing the increasing fat, decreasing carbs. Um, and I actually, I, I was very skeptical, but I, I found that I, I did feel good. Um, but I do want to say that I didn't go low carb by any means. Um, I just tended to during the day have, um, rather than having simple sugars, like, you know, um, apples and pineapple and fruit and like cereal and bread, I had, um, things like butternut squash and parsnips and avocado, but I did increase my fat intake. Um, but then in the evenings I kind of kept my dinner time as the same. So if I wanted pizza, I had pizza. If I wanted lasagna, I had lasagna. So do you think that was because I kind of kept, um, like you said, you know, kept a normal level of carbs, even though most of my carbs or like stodgy carbs, I guess, were in the evening? Or do you think that this just happens to be a coincidence? I mean, it just kind of, this is such an interesting topic. And, um, uh, you know, I, I'm just curious as to if you could go into a little more your thoughts on this, um, yeah, low carb, um, high fat yeah. thing. Well, you know, like you, 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 the things I like probably by no means by what you're telling me, mm-hmm. I don't think by no means you were in the low carb, high fat diet, no. right? So you probably were in a normal carbohydrate, right? And and maybe uh, before you were having more carbohydrates than needed, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's where, like, uh, yeah, you maybe went to a normal carbohydrate diet, and uh, and by substituting decreasing the the carbohydrate, you might increase a little bit more fat, which you're metabolically flexible and you can burn it very well, right? Uh, and that's that that could have been the trick, and maybe you prepare better than other times for a marathon, and everything mm-hmm. coincided yeah, too, yeah. right? But, but make no mistake that uh, if I don't think that you went at all, you know, as a low carbohydrate, yeah. as many people do, because the people really low in carbohydrate diet, they don't have carbohydrates, you know, and they don't have that lasagna or that pizza, you know, at, at dinner, and and this is the whole thing too. Is, is like, the, you know, the, the the guidelines, you know, that are coming out more. I mean. People, you know, people like like me working in, in this area for, for years, we've been already using them, you know, but but I think it's time to really implement them better because they make more sense. It's about telling people how to eat carbohydrates based on grams per kilogram per day. Okay. Right? So the whole thing, like, yeah, my diet has to be 70% uh, carbohydrates or 60%. We don't really know how to calculate that very well, right? But there's research out there showing that uh, depending on your level of physical activity, right? And your glycogen depletion that is going to be resulting from that activity, you need X amounts of, carbo- of, of grams per day of carbohydrates based on your body weight, right? So for example, uh, we know that uh, very, very high level, like Kenyans, for example, are 
or, or professional cyclists, you know, when you're training work, high workloads, right, they, they, um, they have, you know, 8 to 10 grams per kilogram per day. Well, you know, the Kenyans, that's the typical, the Kenyans have about 10.5 grams of carbohydrates per kilogram per day, which is unbelievable. Yeah. And they're the skinniest mm-hmm. runners in the planet, and, and they have dominated at an international level, mm-hmm. right, running for decades. So obviously, if their nutrition is out of whack, there's no way they can dominate a, a discipline at an international level for so many years, right? And no other athletes that we've seen, they, they eat so many carbohydrates as the Kenyans, right? Taromaras, for example, you know, the, the, the runners, right? The Taromaras uh, or Tarahaumaras, whatever, yeah. however you say in English, mm-hmm. they're the same thing. They have a very high carbohydrate diet and they're skinniest. And, and within Mexico, it's one. Of, it's it's the area with the lowest cardiovascular disease and metabolic disease. You know. Um, anyways, what I'm saying is like some people, for example, that uh, they they they're a recreational athlete runner. You know, that prepares for a marathon here and there and runs maybe you know four or five days a week or so. They don't need to have ten, 10 grams per day at all, right? They need to have maybe uh, three to four. Okay. grams of carbohydrates a day, right? Uh, and that, to be honest, you know, um, uh, if, if, if that, you know, if you have like a good fruits, vegetables, and here and there, obviously, you have a lasagna or pizza or pasta, that, that's right there, what, what many people need, you mm-hmm. know? But, uh, so yeah, that, that's another th- th- thing, you know, people, oh, I'm veg- vegetarian, you know, I, I eat fruits and vegetables, so therefore, I might have a bit low in carbohydrate. No, fruits and vegetables have a lot of carbohydrates, mm-hmm. and, and that's what we see with the glycogen scans, uh, I was surprised at first too. I said, "Like, yeah, maybe they're they're low." Uh, like, whoa! I see many people; they're pretty good, you know, in, in glycogen content because they have that diet, and and, and it's good. Yeah. But by no means is a low carbohydrate, high fat diet. Yeah, no, no, that that does make sense, and especially as um, yeah, when I mentioned, I guess for me it was more a change in the the type of carbohydrate. Um, in the yeah. in the past, it was more like I said, cereal or um, a sandwich for lunch, whereas now I kind of switch to, you know, maybe roasted parsnips, some sweet potato, kind of, like you said, more vegetable sources. So does it matter where you get the um, carbs from, from what you found? Or, you know, does it, is it going to help you with uh, using more whole food sources? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, maybe putting things in perspective, obviously, maybe using more whole foods, as you say, right, and and moving away from more processed, refined Mm -hmm. sugars, right? might be better, you know, but at the end of the day, one thing is for energy purposes, right? Uh, especially if you're in the middle of a marathon or a cycling race, you know, if you have Coke, mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you see angels, you know, there, you know, it's just because it really works, you know, uh, that's another thing, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying advocating for Coke, obviously, right? And so, but what I mean is like, when the body is uh, is really really needing it, energy, you know, mm-hmm. it's going to utilize whatever it yes. takes. And yeah. and the and the most simple source uh, could be that Coke, or could be that uh, sports drink, right? Or it could be that uh, uh, you know banana. Sometimes because you have very guys like semi, and the, the body's going to absorb mm-hmm. everything. Mm-hmm. That right? makes sense. And then, so what what are your thoughts on the you know the these ultra runners who maybe do like a hundred milers and they they do eat a low carb high fat diet? Do you have any thoughts on how how they're able to maybe get away with that or how their body is able to do that? If if you know you said about performance going down, are these just anomalies or what? Are you yeah, thinking? so I mean, there's another thing is like uh, there's not much data out there that is reliable. Mm-hmm. Especially not much, data, not much data coming from elite athletes. You know, in fact, uh, uh, there's one study that came out looking at uh, the Western States ultramarathon, yep. right? Uh, where they were they were observing the, uh, the the nutrition of the the top three or the three world class ultramarathon runners participating. In that they had from forty to ninety grams per hour of carbohydrates, mm-hmm. which is the ideal, right? Uh, and, and, and you know. I think one was 40 and the other two was like either 70 and they're 190, you know, which is in the high end mm-hmm. even, right? And uh, so that, that's that, that's that, 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 you know, but definitely there's a lot of anecdotal thing, you know, oh man, I, 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 I moved to a low carbohydrate diet, you know, it works great. Like, you know, uh, who told you that? Yeah, my neighbor, I mean, there's a lot of uh, anecdotal data that I, is not reliable. The other thing that we also have to there are two things happen too. There's an assumption that at low intensities, oh, ultra marathon, we go low intensities. Therefore, we don't burn carbohydrates, so we don't need them. That's not true, because even at low intensities, the body ut- utilizes uh, glucose, and that's what we measure in the laboratory day in day out. You mm-hmm. know, we measure. We have thousands of, of data already, um, so we measure that even at below 
uh, pace goal at low intensity is you might be burning one or even two grams per, per minute of carbohydrates, right? That comes first from the glycogen, right? The glycogen starts to go long. So you have a deposit first, right? And then once they start running out, you, you need to supplement it, right? That's one of the points that is there's an assumption there. The other thing that happens too is like many people, because we come from all this also dr- driven industry, sports drinks, you know, you need to have sports drinks for everything you have. Uh, most of the sports drinks are very high in simple sugars. And what happens is like if you have a high amount of simple sugars, especially in a short amount of time, as many ultramarathons do, right, or they did, right, you start um, um, uh, saturating the transporters in your stomach, right, because the glucose has to be transported or fructose or sucrose has to be transported across the stomach into the bloodstream. Mm-hmm. And for that, you need, you need transporters, right? If you have... Um, a high amount of simple sugars, right? Uh, you're going to saturate the transporter. So therefore, uh, you're, you're going to impede two things, the transfer of glucose into the bloodstream, but mainly the gastric emptying, right? All the water in the stomach too is not going to be able to get out of the stomach, right? Uh, and therefore, that causes the bloating, the vomiting, diarrhea, et cetera. And that's why a lot of ultramarathon runners have had horrible experiences, right, with carbohydrates. And they say, you know what? I'm not going to have carbohydrates. You're like, you know the performance might might improve just by that because they're not they're not vomiting or they're not having being bloated the entire the entire day, right? But if you have a good plan, you know, of nutrition right throughout the month for the ultra marathon run, definitely you can improve your performance. Hmm, interesting. This is this is absolutely fascinating. I feel like I could go on all day asking you more and more things about this, but. Um, I do want to go on to, um, you know, some of the other metabolic diseases, um, including type 1 diabetes for um, our listeners out there. But just before we move on, um, you said about, you know, um, exercise being, you know, one of the solutions here with, you know, uh, preventing the, uh, you, know, you know, these metabolic uh, mm-hmm. diseases like type 2 diabetes. And uh, I think I also read that you called um, Alzheimer's um, the potential uh, type three diabetes essentially. But so can people just kind of say, well, all right, so maybe my parents are, um, they don't really exercise. They are pre-diabetic. So if they exercise, then they'll just be fine again. But are there any cases of athletes with type two diabetes or other, you know, is that just, is that the simple solution or is it, is there more to it than that? So, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so, uh, definitely among endurance athletes who train regularly, right, uh, you know, type 2 diabetes should not exist unless it's a genetic condition, which is a small percentage. You know, it's very, very rare genetic conditions at the uh, metabolic level and uh, processing and metabolizing the glucose, but they're very rare, right? The immense majority, the, the immense majority that we have uh, of type 2 diabetes is, uh, uh, is a, a problem. It's acquired. Right, it's acquired, you know, and uh, and that's where like people who exercise regularly they should be protected, you know, throughout years, and uh, that's why, for example, we, we we know the exercise works not just for type two diabetes, obviously, but uh, uh, it works for 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 cancer prevention. You know, we know that twenty to eighty percent of all cancers depends on the cancers can be prevented through exercise. You know, Alzheimer's disease can be can be reduced by up to fifty percent. You know, wow. through exercise, right. Obviously, all the cardiovascular diseases and metabolic diseases like type 2 diabetes, they can be prevented in the majority of the cases, you know, uh, through through regular exercise and physical activity, you know. So, uh, so yeah, you know, many of these conditions, they should be reverted, you know. Uh, even even people with type 2 diabetes, you know, they if it's acquired for them, they should be able to revert. The problem is, like, we don't know how to do it yet mm-hmm. because it's, it's first you need to get that person moving. There are a lot of socio-cultural or socio-economical issues where why that people that doesn't have the time the day. Mm-hmm. It's not just an exercise, right? There's a lot more to it. Uh, sometimes it's like people don't know how to exercise. You know, they they go there and they see like, man, the, the, the only formula that I have is go to their gym and kill myself, right? I haven't exercised in 20 years now. Okay, I have to go to the gym every day and kill myself because no pain, no gain. And obviously in three months, people quit, right? And, uh, and they hurt themselves because they're, they're exercising at a much higher level, relatively speaking, right, than the highest level athletes in the world, right? So that's where, like, the formula doesn't work, you know, and that's why the whole concept of exercise is medicine, right? It's an evolving concept, and I think the key element is to individualize and tailor exercise programs for each individual, 
And for that, we need to measure metabolism, we need to measure uh, their physiology, and we need to tailor in the same manner that we do with elite endurance athletes, right? We know that one size fits all doesn't improve, right? Uh, that's an, it's not a success. You know, you, you can hurt someone, you cannot help them improve, you know, or you can improve. It's a hit and miss, right? That's why we, we individualize uh, things very well. Um, uh, but the same thing we have to do with people with all these diseases. Okay. And then, so, you know, you said about exercise and, um, you know, obviously if someone has never been a runner before, maybe, you know, I'm thinking of older listeners out there may have, you know, arthritis or something that kind of keeps them from uh, exercising. So I'm guessing, you know, it, it doesn't have to be running or biking exactly. or something strenuous. It can be as simple as walking or... Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. And the thing is, like many people who have an exercise in recent memory, the worst, the worst exercise probably is running. Right, because chances are they might have extra weight. Yeah. Right, their muscles or joints are not ready, uh, so they're going to have a much higher incidence of uh, or, or possibility of getting injured. Right, and the other thing too, they're not oxidizing fat. They're, they're not. They're, it's very strenuous for them. You know, uh, and just walking, just uh, just walking does the trick for many of these people, right? But sometimes, you know, we 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 have the uh, our program now, the exercise medicine program, our, 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 and health and wellness at the at the at the, at the university, and, and we see a lot of people. You know, uh, we have seen about 160 people since January, right? Since we launched it, and uh, many people with these diseases, and sometimes it's just reinforcing them that just walk. You know, mm-hmm. uh, we measure mitochondrial function. I, I developed a it's a simple methodology where we can look at mitochondrial function. I presented in Berlin in October at the World Mitochondrial Society uh, just to see, you know, if they're going to throw tomatoes at me or, or what and get the <laughs> feedback. So, yeah, we, we can already see how is the mitochondrial function. Absolutely, we see there's a huge difference between people with cardiometabolic disease, morally active individual, and people with a, a elite endurance athletes, right? But I think it's about tailoring things, tailoring things, and also adjusting the nutrition too, because as I said earlier, people with these metabolic diseases, they cannot have a lot of carbohydrates because they cannot metabolize them well. So that poses a, a high metabolic challenge for these people. But as their, metabol- as, as their metabolic function and mitochondrial function starts awakening again and get better and better, that's when they start metabolizing more and more. Okay, okay. So then, you know, someone listening right now, I'm just thinking... Uh, you know, maybe a waitress or, uh, well, actually my mum works in a nursery and uh, like a daycare and she's like chasing after kids all day long. And I actually put my um, Runtastic Orbit uh, that tracks your steps on her one day yeah, and she right. walked like 18,000 steps in a day. Wow. And so is that, is that, you know, if you have an active job, that's okay. If you're just doing little spurts here or there, it doesn't have to be a continuous. Um, Absolutely. Okay. I mean, I, I believe so, you know, and, and the fact, yeah, it's not about, just go out there and running, right? But uh, mm-hmm. but if we observe that historically, and I say historically, things are changing, but the societies that live the longest, right, and they have the lowest incidence of cardiovascular disease, obesity, um, uh, overweight, cancer, um, where are the societies? Are the Japanese society, mm-hmm. right? And the Mediterranean countries, right? So uh, these societies, they, they have nothing in common, right? Uh, so they, they have to eat good because if you have a poor diet, it definitely is going to affect your mm-hmm. lifestyle and your, you know, now what is the common thing in their diets of these people on a daily basis? Carbohydrates, mm-hmm. you know, uh, if you do go to Japan, you know, and like, uh, every, every day for, for lunch and dinner is, is it's rice and rice and Fishy. rice and noodles, <laughs> you know, fish absolutely too. But like every single meal has to have rice and, ha- and white rice It's plain freaking white rice, you know, and noodles, mm-hmm. you know? If you go to the Mediterranean countries, you know, every single meal is bread, just normal white bread, yeah, you know, that's true. And, and pasta and rice as well, right? And grains, you know, uh, now they live the longest. Why in the world they live the longest? We know that that diet kills us here in the United States. Why it doesn't, they, they don't kill them? Well, they move, yeah, you know, yeah. and they, they walk to work. They walk to the train station, you know, that the famous 150 minutes of, uh, of activity that the American Heart Association preaches right? To prevent many diseases, which is proven, right? Well, these people get 300 minutes a week. Mm -hmm. They walk everywhere, you know, they're active. And by walking, that's what you're walking, you move your muscles, you know, and and, and those 40 minutes a day that people walk every day or one hour a day even, that that keeps the mitochondria healthy. Therefore, you can burn or you should be able to burn carbohydrates, Mm -hmm. right? And that's what what they do. You know, I'm from originally from Spain, right? And 
And definitely, you know, European countries are having a big problem now because it's going like, like yeah. crazy because people are not moving as much as they do, right? But uh, people who have, uh, especially in, in, in areas that they have been having these healthy habits, you know, of, uh, of moving, exercises, walking, they, they, they make fun of us here in the United States when they say that, when we tell them, no, are you eating bread? Oh, no, 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 that's going to kill you. Are you eating pasta or rice? Like, well, man, <laughs> we've been doing this for generations <laughs> yeah. and they, they live the longest in, yeah. in the world, right? So anyways, uh, so I think it's important to, 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 as long as you're active, you should be able to eat a little of everything. Yeah. yeah. Wow, this is this is absolutely incredible. I'm really, really enjoying learning this and I'm sure a lot of people, other people are. And as much as I want to keep going, I don't want to hold up too much of your time. So I do want to move on to what about, um, okay, so runners or people listening who um, are born with um, or early, uh, uh, develop it earlier in their life, but type 1 diabetes. Yeah. Um, yeah. What about how do people, any thoughts on how they can keep exercising, maybe keep running, where, how they overcome the challenges of that if they've been put off in the past? Absolutely. It's, 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 uh, it's uh, perfectly compatible for running. And not only that, you can get to have... Uh, type 1 diabetes, and you can be uh, professional athletes and elite and even world-class athlete, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's something that I have seen with, uh, there's a professional cycling team. It's called Team Novo Nordisk, yep. right? Yeah, big fans uh, of them. <laughs> so, uh, so I've been working with them two years, and I was in charge of our of the data collection, the research, you know, and applying new methodologies. I learned a lot in these incredible athletes, right? And and now with uh, JDRF, is the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, is is one of the largest foundations in the world. So uh, I, I'm part of a panel of experts that we're putting together new guidelines for type 1 diabetics and exercise, right? Uh, but that's the key because we know exercise is very good for everybody, obviously, but one of the problems that, that was, you know, many people with type 1 diabetes are facing is like they're told by their doctors to exercise and that they have these funky reactions, yeah. you know, they have hyperglycemias, hypoglycemias, uh, you know, they have to end up in the ER sometimes, you know, and, and that there was not many answers to why. And so many, it was very discouraging for, or it is very discouraging mm -hmm. for many, many people with type 1 diabetes. And that's why like JDRF, through a, a grant from Novo Nordisk too, they, they had a brilliant idea, I think, necessary to, hey, let's, let's put together experts in the area and, and put together new updated guidelines, you know, with, because we've been uh, known a lot more, you know, mm -hmm. about uh, why these situations happen. And now we're, we're already finalizing the guidelines. So normally this should be rolled out in, in the entire world, you know, uh, in the next uh, year, two years, you know, for many providers. So, but in the meantime, absolutely. I mean, I, I encourage anybody with type 1 diabetes to exercise. The, the, the Team Novo Nordisk project, for example, is about that. It's about, number one, um, you know, inspiring people. Hey, you have type 1 diabetes. Historically, you were told not to exercise and quit everything, you know, and hey, wait for death, you know, pretty much. Now, hey, you're not only not going to die because you have what, type 1 diabetes, you can be a professional athlete, right? And number two is about acquiring data, right? Yeah. How, how we can avoid these this funky reactions that many people have, you know? So we're done things very, very well lately. And uh, so absolutely, that's a, it's a fantastic uh, opportunity for people with type 1 diabetes to exercise normally. Absolutely, absolutely. I will put a, a link if you if you don't mind sending to me the uh, guidelines that you mentioned and uh, Team uh, Nova Nordisk, especially I've uh, kind of worked with them a lot recently, and I know you oh. work a lot with Tommy Neal, oh, yeah, um, who yeah, is yeah. Uh, who is huh? the one that actually recommended you to me. Oh, so okay. um, yeah, I know that it, that it can work, and Tommy runs at a very high level. So yeah, yeah, don't be discouraged if you are listening, and I'm glad you kind of uh, agreed with it there, and um, you know that that's really really good. To see yeah um, great. so before i just want to ask you one other question before we get onto the final kick round which is kind of where you see your research going in the future like you know you've been working with garmin and you've done some work with tour de france like is there anything you have in mind for the future well i mean i think that you know like in the sports performance i think it's it's uh it's more to i think try to help people at the recreational level because I think this is like a, a huge field that is growing and growing, you know, every, everywhere around the world now. It's difficult to sign up for any event because the, 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 there's a short window. So uh, every year there are any event breaks records of participation. That shows that a lot of people are doing it, but many people don't know how to train, how to eat, how to recover. And it's, there's, we need to address that situation, I think, you know, and we need to talk to a lot of people like that and, uh, and help them. Um, performance, yeah, just, you know, we can keep working with them and try to 
dial in their, their goals, right, and prepare for their uh, events and, um, you know, and improve their lactic cleanse capacity, mitochondrial function, fat oxidation. That's great. We do that also with recreationals, but the whole, you know, teaching, you know, educational process, it's huge. And then, yeah, it's just uh, personally, I, I really am very interested in the, everything related to, uh, you know, prevention and even treatment through exercise of cardiometabolic diseases like mm-hmm. type 2 diabetes, you know, uh, type 1 as well, you know, uh, uh, you know, through the new guidelines that we're putting together and, and even cancer, you know, that's, I think that's exercise as a therapeutics has an incredible future. We have known for, for many years, right, and all the epidemiological studies show that exercise can prevent uh, mm-hmm. all these diseases, right? And it's very easy to say, yeah, exercise does it, but what are the molecular and the genetic mechanisms, right? Uh, you know, so can we identify them so we can use them for, for prescription, you know? And that's, I think that's a huge deal. In cancer, for example, again, we know that 20 to 80% of cancers can be prevented through exercise, depends on the type of cancer. And for survivorship, we know that exercise is significantly increases survivorship. Mm-hmm. What happens in the middle, you know, when they're going through cancer, you know, is there any elements, you know, uh, that we can identify, you know, that, that we can say, wow, this exercise intensity or this mode, you know, it happens to be that uh, it mitigates the expression of some uh, cancer genes or oncogenes, right? And that's something that is a whole field of epigenetics, right? So the genes are fixed. There's nothing we can do about it, uh, but uh, uh, they can be turned on and off, right? Mm-hmm. By many situations, you know, and from chemi- chemicals in our diet or in the pollution, from even infections as well that might be happening to uh, lifestyles, definitely. But uh, and for that, that's part of the whole epigenetics, right? The effectors of, of those genes expression. And, and the most powerful positive epigenetics is exercise. So there's a whole new era, right, to explore now about where this epigenetics of why exercise, it prevents and even treats so many diseases. So I think it's fascinating to use that as more, you know, because the, the more and more research are showing that exercise is at least as, as efficient for treatment mm-hmm. as medications for so many cardiometabolic diseases. So can we really prescribe exercise to people? Oh, how exciting. I really look forward to following that. And, and is the best way to kind of keep up to date with what you uh, are researching, what you are up to? Is that through the uh, University of Colorado website or what would do you have a yeah, protocol? so we have the you know the new center we have open is like the the CU Sports Medicine and Performance Center, mm-hmm. right? That uh, um, yeah, it's a it's a fabulous center we have open at the University of Colorado, and where we can we're already working with a lot of different athletes from work class to recreationals and also the whole exercise is medicine and trying to do research. The problem is it's it's so difficult to 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 get money for the mm-hmm. research. It's never been such a worst time in history of, of science, you know, where it's so difficult to, to get money and funds from the research. So we keep plugging along and try to mm-hmm. do it. Well, if anyone out there listening uh, wants to fund uh, some kind of research like that, they can they can definitely get in touch with you. And um, I'll put links to everything please, please. we've... <laughs> yeah. I'll put links to everything we've talked about at runnersconnect.net forward slash RC104. So I just want to take a moment to thank our sponsor before we get to the final kick round. So uh, we will be back in just a few moments. Some days we need all the motivation we can get to make sure we finish our workout or make it through that cross training session, especially when we're trapped indoors. It has been well documented that running with music or a motivating podcast can help improve performance. But as much as I love the idea, I found myself getting frustrated with the cords getting in my way or when they would rip out of the treadmill. Finally, I have a solution. Jabra Pulse is the sweat-proof, weather-proof, wireless sports earbud that is perfect for runners of all levels and speeds. Even better, it has an accurate in-ear heart rate monitor that quickly connects to your phone so you can ditch the chest strap. The earbuds will have a secure and comfortable fit thanks to the ability to customise the earpieces. Runners Connect listeners can get exclusive offers and enter to win a free Jabra Pulse headset by signing up at jabra.com forward slash runners connect. That's J-A-B-R-A dot com forward slash runners connect to start your journey or by the Jabra Pulse at your local Best Buy. Jabra, this is where it starts. Okay, and we are back. I just have the one more section, which is the final kick round. Um, So firstly, if we could start with what the greatest advice you've ever received is. Listen to your mom. <laughs> <laughs> I love I that, say, yeah. <laughs> because they're never wrong, moms. <laughs> never wrong. 
Oh, I bet. Well, you have to get your mum to listen to this. Like she, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, what is your favourite running book? Or, well, I guess it doesn't have to be running. Your favourite uh, wellness w- or anything kind of book or blog? There are, there are many of them. For running, I, I, you know, the Born to Run, it's, it's, it's a wonderful book, mm-hmm. right? It's very mystic and at the same time, at the same time scientific, right? I, I, it's a great book, recommendable to anybody. Oh yeah, no, we've we've had Chris McDougall on the show before, oh, and I will great. put a link to his show notes. Awesome. He's, he was he's awesome, and uh, actually, I'm going to bring him back on in a few months. So, oh great! Um, yeah, we're going to be recording that very soon. So he's a great guy. So definitely agree. All right, what what would be your advice to a new runner? You've kind of mentioned a few things, but yeah, I mean, to a new runner, it's just like uh, yeah, it's just you know, seek some uh, advice, right? Uh, you're running and like, hey, you know, where do I have to train? How do I, how many times a week? When should I recover? What should I have to eat? Uh, you know, I think that's very first advice. Just look for help, you know, which is something that here in, in, in the United States, there's not much tradition, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, as you probably know, in Europe, right, there, there are a lot of people that they, that they, they go to, you know, you know, Places, you know, from sports medicine clinics or physiology laboratories where they get a little more scientific data about mm-hmm. themselves, where people hear more just to get their shoes and run, right? Yeah. So, you know, look for some advice some from a professional at, at any entry level, right? Anybody is going to always give you some advice, but, you know, a little bit in a scientific manner. And if I'm if I may, I'm going to plug Runners Connect just here because uh, that is something that we really pride ourselves on is is getting that real scientific knowledge and you know the kind of um, research that we've talked about today. That is what we source on our articles. So I would love if anyone listening would use us if you are l- looking for that kind of information. Yeah. <laughs> Shameless plug there. <laughs> okay. Um. What would be your pre-race or what what did you eat as your pre-race meal when you were um, competing? Well, I mean, I, I, I don't compete anymore. I, I wish mm-hmm. I could, but, but I, uh, you know, before a long, you know, exercise day running or on the bike, you know, I, I mean, I, I like, uh, I mean, I, I like some form of carbohydrates and, uh, mm-hmm. I personally like, uh, you know, my, my weakness is like a croissants with a uh, marmalade. Ooh, yeah. you know? oh, <laughs> like, very, like, with marmalade. <laughs> interesting choice. I, my, my family, um, back in England love marmalade, but, um, I'm, I, since I've moved to the U S I had just heard, don't really. <laughs> have it so interesting choice but i love that okay and finally your favorite um running or fitness product that you've come across i think when it comes to running any cool new comfortable shoes i shoes. i, I mm-hmm. love them you know it's just something that uh yeah it's just the thing that yeah it, it, you pull your new shoes and start running like wow you feel like a million mm-hmm. bucks the first day so then just out of curiosity are you into the kind of hoka end of things where they're like the really thick um you know ultra cushion shoes yeah. or are you more into the minimalist kind of chris mcdougall style i'm more into the cushion okay. but not so not so dramatic right <laughs> more in the middle term but something is comfy you know okay. I, I don't have good feet and i, I need to be comfortable <laughs> uh-huh. yeah okay cool all right well um thank you so much for your time i really thank really you. have enjoyed this and it's been absolutely fascinating and you know like i said i could go on for hours but i really appreciate your time and um i look forward to seeing what you come up with next well, thank you so much. And, uh, and, and also, yeah, thank you for having me here. And thank you for what you're doing for the community. I think it's great that uh, there's a, a very good high level source out mm-hmm. there, you know, for, for runners, oh. right, to, to look for attention and link to other places. So I think that's fantastic. Thank you. We really appreciate that. Well, my mind is blown. That was just so fascinating. I could have gone on for hours and I do apologize. I'm sure some of you probably would have rather I did keep going, but I did promise I would try and keep these episodes to around an hour for those people who do have to get going. So we talked about uh, lots of carb kind of things today and just exercise and how important it is. But hopefully most of you already know that because you are listening to this episode and it is a running podcast. Um, but next week we are going to go back to the kind of motivation side of things. And we're going to be talking to Ellie Greenwood, who is an ultra runner. She's won all kinds of award. And, and I think you're really going to enjoy listening to that episode. Just a little reminder that you can actually still enter to win Brad Beer's You Can Run Pain-Free Uh, giveaway he's giving away five books so make sure you go to the show notes at runnersconnect.net forward slash rc104 and i will put a link to uh, the giveaway there and then finally um 
as you hear, our sponsor is Jabra, and we've really been enjoying kind of working with them. And I just wanted to give a little shout out to our two winners who have won so far, and that is uh, Nadia and Steve. So both of them have received their Jabra headphones and have been enjoying them. And make sure you remember that you can enter to win a free set of headphones. So check that out. And uh, I hope you enjoy them as much as I do. So that is all for this week. And I really hope you have a great week. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks.